Hi everyone, welcome back to workshop and it's repair time again and yes, this is another Agilent power supply. I think this will be number five. I think I've bought three from this particular seller. This one came from eBay, uh, put an offer on it and uh, it was accepted. So I just thought it was a bit of a project, this one here. And as you can see, the front of it is just completely broken and shattered and it's just in a million bits. You probably can't see it too clearly on camera, but the front is actually shoved in a bit. The circuit board at the back is at a weird angle, uh, pushed in at the bottom there. And uh, well, yes, it's just in a bit of a state. Uh, crucially, the photographs uh, on the ad showed that the unit powered up in this state and there was something reading on the VFD here. So I know the VFD is good. I wouldn't have bought it otherwise because getting a hold of these VFDs are probably pretty tough. Um, but yes, it was powered up. It was something on the display and you can actually buy replacement front panels. So I've got one of those and uh, we'll be able to retrofit that. So I will be stripping it down, obviously, and taking all the parts off, the rubber membrane, the circuit board, etc. And uh, retrofitting that to the new panel. Now, this is actually an E3633A. I haven't had this model before. Um, like I've said in previous videos, there's just loads and loads of different models and different output configurations, different voltages, different power, etc. And this is one of the higher power ones. This one here is a single channel with the sense terminals and it has two options on the output. You can either have 0 to 8 volt at 20 amps or 0 to 20 volts at 10 amps. So it's basically a 200 watt power supply. So I'm obviously not going to put power into it like this. I'm going to strip it down to start with. Let's see what we've got behind this broken front panel. It's quite a heavy unit being a 200 watt power supply. It will have a rather large transformer in it. So looking at the inside, it's the usual covered in dust. Um, got a lot of large heat sink here with a fan mounted on it. Fan seems nice and free, so hopefully that's still okay. But yes, it does need a bit of a, a blowout there to clean up all that grime and dust. This power supply looks like it's been left on 24-7. You kind of got some... Oh, wow. Wow. Just noticed this here. Lying on my workbench when I pulled it. So that is a... TYN640 and uh, something's rattling about in the bottom here I don't know if you can see that but watch this this electrolytic cap just floating around there the other two either side are okay but this one here wow look at that and the pins are not broken I suspect that somebody's maybe had a go at this before. Is that more stuff falling off? Let's have a look at the underside. Wow, it's heavy. Now this is where this uh, capacitor fell from. Now it hasn't been desoldered. It just looks like it's broken free from its solder joints. I mean, like I said, the pins are all intact. It just looks like it's been shocked into just uh, breaking free from the solder joints there. You can tell there's no flux or nothing on them. It's just been ripped out from the back. And I suspect that was probably from its fall at the time it broke the front panel. And wow, this... And I know you can't see this in camera, but the circuit board's got a right bend... Uh, in one direction going towards the front panel and that's the one half of the rotary encoder as you will have seen in my last video I did manage to put one of these back together and get it all working and uh, hopefully we can do the same with this one although it does look like a, a slightly different model
and there's the front panel board which doesn't look too bad but yes it does just look like this has been ripped off of its mounting point the clips here that hold it together look like they're intact as do the actual contacts themselves so hopefully we can save this rotor encoder and the membrane as well just needs a bit of a wash that's all so to get this front panel off I do need to remove the jumpers the sense jumpers in the front here if I can and the other one yes with a, a bit of a hit here it looks like the bananas have been forced in this direction quite a bit and that's bent the PCB round but here we go we can pull off the front panel and what we've got here is a couple of stickers this is a serial number of the unit this has probably come from a lab it's quite normal to have the serial number of the unit that's normally on the back panel of the power supply repeated on the front just for tracking the power supply etc and all the paperwork for calibration and that sort of thing but it does actually have another sticker here a handwritten one 5.5 volts EVB the EVB normally stands for evaluation board so uh, a total guess here it sounds like this unit here was permanently set to 5.5 volts for power and some sort of evaluation board uh, during its life who knows but uh, I've got a new front panel and it comes with a, a membrane here uh, which so we don't need any of this here I think I will need to retain the smoke perspex screen here which has got the E633A etc on it so that'll be a that'll need a bit of a clean up and this tape this uh, brown tape's not going to make that any easier as you can see the glue stays behind when you peel it and if you look a little bit closer here the transformer mounting has actually shifted as well so that's not going to help the PCB so I'll probably need to remove the transformer and straighten it out so I think the next thing I'll do is unbolt the transformer and let's see if I can't uh, have a look underneath and let's see if I can find out where that uh, TO220 package came from and uh, see if we can uh, affect a repair there and I'll also just go ahead and stick this capacitor back on as well and I'll resolder some of the joints or the bigger joints and the for instance that other two capacitors there, the big ones there well, that's a transformer pulled to the side there it should give me enough room to straighten the brackets on the power supply chassis and also the transformer itself and what I can see underneath if I just zoom in here you can see CR239 is missing it's actually an SCR TYN640 and it was underneath the transformer so I suspect that got a bit of a whack possibly when the transformer was pushed down when all these brackets bent and it's probably what broke it off so I should be able to replace that no problem at all I'll have to order a new one so hopefully there's no other damage being caused by having the power supply powered up for the eBay ad when it was in this state with this bulk capacitor uh, loose and also this SCR floating around in the bottom of the power supply somewhere so to straighten the brackets on the transformer and the chassis I'm actually going to use an adjustable spanner so let's have a look here wow that's not half had a bend so I think first things first is we'll try the adjustable spanner ah yes no problem and that's looking not too bad and just at this other end here as well it just needs bent down very slightly I think that'll do it for the transformer and then back to the chassis
Now the bend in the circuit board, there is actually another bracket here which is bent out of place which is pulling the circuit board down at this end especially and also the other end so I'll need to straighten those as well. Now the circuit board in this unit here is like, I think like the first one I uh, repaired a few months ago and that was it's a single board construction. The analog board and the digital board are all one and it's just this one great big board here. So, and I did manage to remove that no problem for all the troubleshooting and testing and repairing that I was doing. So I think I'll do that with this one as well and it'll give me a chance to bend these circuit board brackets here uh, with this, when the circuit board's removed. So let's uh, remove the circuit board and get it onto the workbench. So there we go, that's it laid out on the workbench here. Nice access to the circuit board, top side and bottom side, no problem at all. I've got tail here for the front panel, that should be okay. I have had to remove one cable from the transformer. That comes way across to P11 uh, over here. And so uh, if I remember rightly, I made a small extension uh, in order to have that plugged in. And uh, I think I'll try and clean the board up a little bit more with some IPA. It's sadly needing it. I don't really want to power it up when it's in this state. Well, in the end, I disconnected all the cables, disconnected the transformer, etc. And took the PCB to the kitchen sink and just got an old paintbrush and just went to town in it with some uh, flux cleaner and PCB cleaner. And as you can see, it's a lot cleaner than it was. I just went everywhere. So i just got to dry it off now. I'll do that immediately. I don't want any water um, or moisture to sit around too long, especially underneath ICs, etc. That's where trouble can start. So I'll uh, get the heat gun on it now and give it a good dry off and then we'll be ready to move forward. There we go. It's the uh, circuit board's quite warm. It's not hot to touch, but it's quite warm, so that helps with the evaporation of the water. And yes, I was using a heat gun. That's what I've been using for 30 years to try off circuit boards. Um, as long as you know what you're doing with a heat gun, I don't think there's a problem whatsoever. You just have to be very careful that uh, you spread the heat around and you don't uh, concentrate the heat too much in one place. But uh, yeah. And it's looking pretty dry at the moment. Of course, uh, underneath the ICs, still be quite uh, wet probably. But that idea is by heating up the underside of the board as well, that gives a chance for the heat to soak through to the other side and, and the underside of the IC. And of course, you are doing the top side as well. Probably not as hot, but uh, that gives the, a, ch a good chance for it to evaporate. And I'll probably leave the power supply board overnight in the nice warm workshop before I even attempt putting power back in. But there's plenty to do in the meantime. I will change out this reefer cap here, this big one, the 100 nanofad one. I will refit this uh, capacitor here. So that's the reefer cap removed. So let's have a look through my stock and see if we can find a suitable one to go in its place. Yeah, it'll have to be one of these ones here. It's a bit of a smaller package. Um, these are X2 slash Y2 class capacitors and that'll be perfect to go in place of the reefer which is an X2 class and I'll just have to bend the legs a little bit and it's the same size, 100 nanoparad so we'll put that in. There we go, that's it fitted. Perfect. Okay, time to fit the replacement TYN640. Ordered it last night from RS and it came about 11 a.m. this morning. Fantastic delivery from RS. Uh, amongst all my other suppliers like Farnell, DigiKey, they take at least a few days. Sometimes Farnell are next day, but more often than not, they are like two day delivery. But RS are always next day delivery if I order before 8.30 at night. Really good service. So let's get the new one fitted and then I'll start taking a look at the display board to get that uh, built back up again and plug it into this main board ready for power up of the power supply. And here's the display board and it looks to be fairly well intact apart from the rotary encoder of course. It doesn't look to be bent. The metal work around the 
VFD doesn't appear to have been uh, touched either with the impact that it got from the front end so it looks to be uh, in pretty good condition. A few marks in some of the corners of the circuit board where it's obviously been bashed but uh, nothing too bad so it's just a case I think of uh, bringing the rotary encoder back to life but uh, I will clean it up. So there does appear to be some damage or very slight damage anyway to the actual rotary encoder itself that I never really noticed before and these actual pins the actual contact pins here I think they're maybe slightly out of alignment this one on the left here I think maybe needs pushed a little bit to the left there the other ones look okay but it's just very very fractional but uh, I should manage to do something with that and then I'll, I'll clean them up a little bit they do look to be a little bit tarnished so I'll use my fiberglass pen very lightly just to clean it up and uh, hopefully we can put it back together and I'll actually clean up this part here with some IPA and put down some of my uh, uh, lubricant on there uh, before I reassemble it so let's get on with that Wow, wow, look at the dirt coming off of that. That looks to be good. Now some very light use of the fiberglass pen. And that's it. And I'll straighten up the pins if I can as well. Yes, that should do it. And uh, to lubricate it, I'm using some of my deoxit shield again. Now there are a couple of plastic locators, uh, one of them's missing there, it's gone, and this one here is bent over at an angle, so I don't think I've got much choice but just to remove that, there we go. Oh, in fact, you can see the plastic locator that's broken, it's in the body of the actual encoder itself. Okay, here we go. it's located now I think now I just need to try and squeeze down the clips so that they get a good grip on that top body how reliable it will be without the locators that uh, were obviously broken I'm not too sure because we're only relying now on the clips locating the top part of the body of the encoder down onto the bottom part. But right, let's get the main board back in and let's plug in the display board to see if we can power up. First things first, let's plug in some of the wiring. So, luckily the PCB's marked. And I've got an extension here for one of the other secondaries that won't reach, that should be made up. Right, let's power up, see what happens. Got display, reset, and we're showing output off on the display. Let's take a look at that. I'm not sure if you can read that because I don't really have the filter on it. But uh, no error. It's looking good at the moment.
and fans working. So let's put a meter on the output of the power supply and see if we're getting anything there. Right, I've got a multimeter hooked up. Let's see if we're getting anything. Power up again. Let's put output on. Wow, error. Let's try that again. Of course, I haven't checked my supplies yet. Uh, just wanted to see if it was doing anything. I'll have to go right round all the DC supplies on the main board, which there's quite a number of. And as soon as I go output output on, it basically goes into error mode and I'm getting minus 0.4 of a volt on the display. But that could be calibration and it's going into a constant current mode. Wow, it's not happy. Rotor encoder appears to be working because I can hear it clicking as I rotate it. Yeah. I'll set the output to 5 volts. And it's just error. Yep. Yeah. Output doesn't appear to be doing much at all. So I think the next thing I'll do is I'll go and check all the supplies, all the DC supplies on the underside, which are quite a number of. I'll not film that, I'll go away and check all them, make sure they're all okay, and then we'll come back. Well, so far all the supplies look okay on the underside, plus or minus 17, plus or minus 15. The 5 volt supplies, or well, the two 5 volt supplies all seem okay. So I just had another look across the board and I've spotted something. This is the SCR that I replaced, and look at this capacitor here. I never really noticed it before, but uh, obviously quite logical. Actually, it's been uh, it's been hit really when the SCR was pushed that way, and it's actually broken the uh, one of the pins on it. So whether that has anything to do with the problem, I'm not sure. The other one looks okay, so I'll uh, remove that capacitor there. Uh, I don't think it's uh, broken the solder joint in the PCB and underside. I think it's actually damaged the the actual capacitor. So I think it's pulled the leg away from the body of the capacitor. So I'll remove that one there and I'll replace it. Okay, with all the supplies intact and I've taken a quick look at the calibration and it failed as well. So that was the quick hit. Uh, tests that I did just in case it was possibly the answer to the problem but no it wasn't so now we need to actually delve into the circuit diagrams and start taking a look at some voltages in and around the circuit. So this is the main power output circuit as you can see we've got the banana jacks at the right hand side here the out plus, the out minus and the sense plus and the sense minus and if you follow the positive one back you'll see you've got the main current sense resistor there, that's a very low ohm, a tap coming off of that, basically a feedback for the uh, current sense and you've got the main series pass resistor here and on the drain side of that you've got the main bank of capacitors there, that's those large capacitors, the three large capacitors and it's bleed resistor there. So within that you've got all these op amps here that are controlling basically the constant voltage circuit, the constant current circuit and also a method for just turning off the output. These three op amps here all come together in a sort of OR gate fashion. There's a diode on the output there, there and there. So that any one of them can basically have control over the small transistor and in turn the main series pass transistor. Okay, I've given the smoke glass screen a little bit of a clean up just so you can see it a bit clearer on camera. So let me power up. Now what I've gone ahead and done is I've actually saved some output voltages and current settings on the uh, EEPROM and I'll just recall them now. There we go. And as you can see I'm immediately in an error mode. 
Now, one thing to note is the CC light is on, the constant current uh, indicator is on. That would seem to indicate that the power supply is actually permanently in the constant current mode. Now, it does actually come out of that every now and then, or it flashes, but the output always stays at minus 0.35 or so uh, volts there. Now, I have actually disabled the over voltage and the over current protection uh, as well, so as you can see, the indicators are off for that at the moment. Now, it doesn't matter whether I go to 8 volts or 20 volts mode, we st we're still seem to be stuck in CC mode. Okay, so I think I've identified a problem with the control circuit here. Uh, looking at the signals from the output of the main constant voltage op-amp and also the constant current one, they seem to be doing weird things. They're not stable, they're up and down like a yo-yo a little bit. So following back the constant voltage one, for instance, through here, through this uh, other op-amp here, which just provides a bit of gain, you've got the main CV ref signal. This is the main signal from the D to A converter. And similarly, up in the constant current uh, op-amp here, you've got the signal from the CC ref. That's the main signal from the same DAC. So I'll put my multimeter on the outputs of the op amps and see what's happening. Okay, so pin 8 is the output direct from the CV ref. And it doesn't seem that stable. It does seem to be jumping around a little bit. Well, it looks like I was heading in the right direction. I was getting closer and closer to the CV ref signal and I found something. So as you can see we're sitting at minus 0.2 if I just uh, press down on the DAC IC it immediately jumps up to 8 volts and we're in constant voltage control. I'll release it and it's away again. Now when I press down on the DAC I mean, it is actually pressing down quite a big area of the board so it's not necessarily the DAC but certainly I think we've found a problem. So I think the first thing I'll do is I'll uh, reflow the DAC and uh, take it from there. So I reflowed the DAC and it didn't make any difference. So I did a little bit more detective work and it's E6 that was causing the problem. And that is a core shielding bead. It's just in series with the power to the DAC or one of the uh, DC supply lines to the DAC. And that's what was causing the problem. Nothing visible that I could see, but obviously it was making and breaking and that's what uh, caused the problem. So now you can see when I've powered up now and I recall the uh, existing save parameters, everything's working great. And if, if I press down in the board, that's the fan you're hearing there if you can hear that. If I press down in the board now, there is no longer any problem. It's working okay. And you can see the calibration isn't too bad either. This is the output voltage from the actual power supply. And as you can see, it's uh, almost exactly the same. 3.994 or 3.998. And if I just uh, increase the voltage up or down, all the way up to 8 volts. All the way down to 0 volts. I think it could do a little bit of a recalibration, but I can do that once it's all fully assembled. And then 20 volt mode. all the way up to 20 volts. Perfect. And I've got no doubt that the current side of things will be working uh, no problem as well. So, is it fixed now? Well actually it's not. We've still got a problem. Let me power up and see if I can demonstrate this one. So it starts up fine. Let me put on the membrane. And let's turn it on. Let me get rid of the membrane for a second. As you can see, we've got it set to 6 volts and we're getting about 6 volts on the output. But just watch. Without me doing anything. There we go. And it just resets and goes into all sorts of funny stuff. It's not the same every time. And I can hear the buzzer, little piezoelectric buzzer on the main board which clicks as you key press and you can hear it clicking away uh, whenever it does this. So I'll just turn off the power again. Let me put back on the membrane. Now the reason I put it on the membrane is so that I can put it in a turn the outputs on. 
by recalling oh, oh. Oh, didn't even give me a chance to do that let's try again because what I want to do this time is power it up get it in the 6 volt output mode then I'm going to disconnect the display board Okay, I've disconnected the display and as you can see i am still got 6 volts in the output because as far as the main board is concerned it's still running and if I leave it like that or if I move the board around here flex it do all sorts of other stuff with it no matter what I do and no matter how long I leave it I always have 6 volts in the output so here's the board and unfortunately all the IECs and components or 95% of them are underneath the VFD as you can see. So it doesn't look like I've got much choice. I'm going to have to take the VFD off the display board to get it to circuit underneath and see if I can work out what's happening. Okay that's the VFD taken off. A bit of desoldering work there with the desoldering gun and uh, carefully managed to get it removed quite successfully. I've taken the rotary encoder off just so I can tighten it up. I've got my thermal camera here. If we just look down onto the board, you can see U7 there, that's a microcontroller. And along here we've got a 5 volt regulator and 4 resistors and they are hot, hot, hot to touch. So let's take a look at the schematic. So remembering that the display board is minus 17.4 volt referenced you've got a section over here called the minus 13 volt supply supply coming in here through some dropper resistors here and into the input of this 5 volt regulator uh, which like I said is referenced to minus 17.4 volts so that produces the 5 volts that 5 volts is there and it seems quite stable however it is pretty hot that regulator and the four dropper resistors as you'd expect they're 14.7 ohms each and they actually get really really hot and I'm sure they're way too hot and out of spec and so what I can deduce from that is something is drawing too much current. Now on the thermal camera you can see that the only other thing that was getting warm was the actual microcontroller itself. So looking at the 5 volt regulator you've got a tantalum capacitor across the input and another tantalum capacitor across the output. This is the one across the input. It powers off and you're looking at well more than 3k. This is the tantalum across the output. 5 volt rail, 31 ohms. That seems very low. So at the moment I'm thinking there's a problem with the microcontroller and that's why the comms is going haywire on its output back to the main board and causing all those sorts of uh, problems and the thermal camera seems to back it up it does seem to be getting warm i th think that it's drawing too much current from the 5 volt regulator and that's why we're getting some heat over here and looking at the data sheet for this 8051 it should be drawing a maximum of around about 38 milliamps if it was running at the full 24 megahertz which I'm not sure it is I think this is a, a 12 megahertz oscillator here so really it should be drawing about 20 milliamps but looking at the voltage across the dropper resistors here and calculating the current through it it looks like we're drawing a lot more than that hence the heat so just to try and back that up, I think I'll put my meter across some of the components here with the power off and let's see what sort of resistances we're getting across the various points around the circuit. Now I should be doing this really with a six and a half digit multimeter but we're going to try it with my uh, BM786 here. It should have just about enough resolution to be able to do this. So the 5 volt supply is over here, as I mentioned earlier, C5 is a tantalum capacitor across the output of the 5 volt regulator. So if I just go across there right now, with power off, 
30.66 ohms on the multimeter. So then let's go across one of the ICs here. Thirty point six four. It's a little bit less. Thirty point six two, and here's the decoupling capacitor across the five volt supply just before it goes into the microcontroller. If I've got my thirty point five seven. So as you can see, the further I get towards the microcontroller, the lower the resistance I'm measuring across the 5 volt supply points and that's pointing the finger at this IC here as being the source of that large current. Now the next problem is that this microcontroller contains the software within it. It's not like the main board microcontroller which has a separate prom to store the code and meaning I could just lift the microcontroller and replace it and not a problem. The code is actually inside this 8051. So I've got a way forward uh, to get around that. I'm going to lift this microcontroller from the board, pop it into my EEPROM programmer and read the code out. Hopefully it won't cause a problem with the uh, programmer given it's drawing a little bit too much current but uh, yeah we'll take a chance on that. Right I've removed the microcontroller from the board quick check of the 5 volt supply now 11.6k that's great and the supply pins of the 8051 I think it's across these two here there we go, 30.8 ohms. So the next thing I want to do is back up the PROM because uh, I'm going to program a new PROM in its place. I've uh, got one in order from RS. It's, uh, you can't get these 8051s anymore but the package is well known and there's a few other manufacturers make something compatible. So I should be, should be able to get that up and running. So I'm going to use my S4 for this. As you can see I've got a couple of adapters there, the, 80, the 8751 adapter into the S4, then I've got a dip to PLCC adapter plugged into that. And uh, looking at the PROM list on the S4, I've selected Atmel 89C51. So we'll drop the PROM in there, into the ZIF socket at the top, and we'll do a load. There we go, and we'll edit that just to have a look at the code. It's starting at zero, and we've got something there. By default, the memory of the S4 is filled with FF, so looks like we've got code. Yep, and there's a good uh, variety of uh, hex there, so it's looking good. Now I think I'm actually pretty lucky to be able to read the code. I'm not sure if these 8051s have got a protected mode. In other words, you can lock down the code inside them. Some PROMs do, some PROMs don't. And the other thing was, because this PROM, I believe, has a fault, hence the 30 ohms across the supply, it's a wonder it's working at all. What I reckon is the core's working okay, the core memory inside it. It's maybe one of the I.O. Uh, registers or something like that that's maybe uh, got a fault and that's what's drawn all the power. Um, but uh, like I said, luckily we're able to read it into the S4. So I'll prom up a new one and then we'll get that onto the display board and we'll take it for there. Okay, whilst I was waiting in RS, I did fit this low profile 44 pin PLCC socket. I just hand soldered it, it was easy enough to get to the pins, so no problem there. And now my new microcontrollers arrived, and the one I've actually gone ahead and bought, I bought a couple of different types because you never know. This is the RS stock number 1771865. So it's a uh, 89C51RC2. So now down onto the programmer, if I hit PROM and you can see I've already pre-selected the 89C51RC2 because the Dataman S4 does actually support it. So let's pop in the PROM 
let's get it the right way around there we go and we'll do an arrays first of all so function burn arrays should be done and we'll test it to make sure that it is blank I'm only going to test it up to FFF because that's all we need yep blank ROM so we're now we can go ahead and burn it and I'm only going to burn 0 to FFF and it comes up same which means it's programmed perfectly so now we can fit the new microcontroller to the socket and just press that in there we go now I don't have the display fitted so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit the membrane and I'm going to hit the output on off button and we should hear a beep from the piezoelectric beeper on the main board over there so let's uh, power up there we go and I'll just hit the button and yes I can hear a beep on off perfect so what I'll go ahead and do now is go and refit the VFD to the board uh, along with its metal retention brackets and let's see if the display board's working and more importantly has it fixed the problem and check this out that's the VFD flat on the PCB and look at the uh, socket the PLCC socket it barely fits in there and no more okay ready for a power up membrane fitted VFD fitted let's put power on self test yes looking good rotary encoder working buttons are working displays working so now I just need to let it sit for a few minutes and see if the problem appears again it seemed to happen after a few minutes probably after the microcontroller heated up inside and it started to fail so we'll just leave it for a few minutes and see what happens and then I'll come back right I've let it sit for about half an hour I got properly warmed up and it's stable I don't think there's any problem anymore so I've gone ahead and hooked up my electronic dummy load off camera and I've got the power supply set to 20 volts and it, I've set the current up to 10 amps so I'm going to give it 9 amps at 20 volts so I'll just do that now I've got the output voltage over here which is also on the display there of course so I'll just turn on the electronic load now and you can see I'm showing 9 amps it does need recalibrated like I said and we're maintaining 20 volts on the output no problem at all So I don't really have any doubt now that the power supply is fully working. Um, I'm not going to bother filming putting it back together with its new front panel. Uh, I think I've seen that in uh, all my other Agilent uh, power supply videos. So I think, uh, like I said earlier on in the video, I'm going to keep this power supply. It's going to go up onto the workbench and uh, it will be used uh, for the high current applications. Thanks for watching.